Okay, so this week we're going to look at deserts. So we're just kind of going through the different environments that we see. And if we can understand something about the environments, then we can certainly understand how to identify them in the rock record, which is what we'd like to do. So uh, when we think of deserts, hopefully we're thinking of the image on the left and not the image on the right, though the image on the right looks pretty darn good. So what we want to do is establish a definition for a desert. So for us, we're going to say that the number one factor, the really the only thing we're going to care about is that an area that receives less than 10 inches of rainfall a year can be considered a desert. So we're not going to look at any other criteria except for that, though we can associate some other factors to areas that have this condition. So some misconceptions are that this is what deserts look like and only what deserts look like. And of course, that is not true because we're using our definition of less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. So we can have places where there is no sand. We can have places where it's cold or where it's rocky or hello, where we live. There's not sand dunes everywhere, but we do in a lot of places in Arizona get less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. The other thing is that we always think that deserts have to be hot. Now, yes, it does get very hot here in the valley, but that's not always true in places that have low amount of precipitation. And so a lot of times we get places that are very, very cold. And what we'll come to find out is really the temperature of the air is a really big driver for how much moisture an area will get. What we'll see is that hot air tends to have a lot, has the capability to store a lot of water vapor, where cold air cannot store as much. And so in areas where it's super cold, there just isn't much moisture available. And a lot of times that can lead to low rainfall. What else? Uh, you know, in the deserts, there's no life there. And you're marching along on the ridge of the dune here, thinking you're going to die and seeing mirages and all that stuff. But of course, we know that deserts, like where we live, there's lots of life. It's just a little different than other places. Certainly, there is life in the desert, depending on how much moisture you get. Okay, so this is what we kind of expect from deserts, is that the big thing is less than 10 inches of rainfall a year, but it can be hot, it can be cold, there can be sand, there can be no sand, they can be very rocky. In general, there's not much vegetation. And if we stick to this rainfall criteria, we would argue that deserts cover roughly about a third of Earth's land surface. So where do deserts form? So we want to look at regions that are dictating a very dry environment, which potentially is leading to an area we would call a desert. What we're going to say is that one of the big reasons that we have a lot of deserts at what we're going to talk about is north 30 degrees latitude and south 30 degrees is because of this global air circulation. This idea that the air masses are rising and falling based on their temperature, right? You've heard the term hot air rises. That is true because hot air is less dense than cold air and so it will rise upward. That hot air has the capacity to store a lot of moisture. But as it changes temperature and cools, it can't hold all the water vapor that it has. So it turns to a liquid and falls as rain and it loses that moisture through that process. And so what we see is that the equator gets a majority. It gets direct sunlight all the time. And so it's one of the hotter parts of the planet. So the air is hotter there. And so that hot air is evaporating a lot of moisture and it's rising upward because it's less dense in the surrounding air and the air above it. And so as it rises up, though, it gets colder. And so as it gets colder, it loses its moisture. And this is why a lot of rainfall happens near the equator. The rising air loses its cooling down and losing all that moisture it accumulated near the surface. And it rains heavily. By the time it gets up to the upper atmosphere, and it's being pushed out of the way by the others, we form these little convection cells. But this air mass that's high in elevation now and very cold has lost most of its moisture. So when it sinks back down, 
it now does not have much moisture and it's heating up, which means it can hold a lot more. So it tends to dry out these areas by absorbing lots of moisture and not giving much back. So we'll go through five places in general that we get deserts because of kind of this air kind of difference in temperature and motion. And the first is kind of what I just talked about, this idea that we have these subtropical areas in the general vicinity of 30 degrees north and south, 30 degrees south of the equator, because of this global air circulation idea. And so the idea that the hot air near the equator has the capacity to hold lots of water vapor, and so it's evaporating a lot of moisture as it rises upward because it's hot and less dense in the surrounding air, it loses its moisture as it cools because it's rising upward, it's cooling, and it rains a lot near and around the equator. Then the air mass is very cold up here, doesn't have much water left because it gave it all back. It's heavy, it sinks down, and then, of course, it doesn't have much moisture to give back here, and it's heating up so it has the capacity to store a lot, so it tends to be dry here. And so we kind of chalk this up to global air circulation would be a very short way to explain why we have dry areas at 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Okay. We also get deserts in the middle of continents because certainly one of the best sources for moisture is the oceans. And so as the air mass moves over the ocean, it's evaporating, storing lots of water, as it moves over the continent and the air mass temperature changes, let's say from warmer to colder, it loses moisture. So it falls as rain. So it doesn't have as much. If it crosses another large body of water, it can maybe get some back. But in places like the Gobi Desert, which is very far from any water source, as the air mass moves along and drops water and drops water and drops water, it doesn't have a way to get any back. So by the time it reaches the middle of the continent here, it just doesn't have much moisture to give to the desert or that area, and it turns into a desert. And so we tend to get uh, those types of deserts because they're far from the source of moisture, which would be the ocean basins. So that's number two. Number three is something we're familiar with, which is what's called a rain shadow desert. And it's still related to this idea of the temperature of the air mass. And so for us, we'll say, let's look at California and Arizona here. We have a, a current, like a jet stream, you've probably seen, that kind of in general runs across the country, the United States, from west to east. And what we see is as the air mass moves across the Pacific Ocean, it's pulling up water, it's evaporating, it's storing some water vapor in the atmosphere. And as the air mass runs into, for us, the Sierra Nevadas, which is a large mountain range that kind of runs up the coast here, the air mass has to rise up and over the mountains. And in doing so, as the air mass rises, it gets colder. You said cold air can't hold as much water as warm air, and so it loses a lot of the moisture it accumulated at sea level and that moisture falls as rain or snow on the west side of the Sierra Nevadas. By the time it gets to the top of the mountain and comes over, it has lost a lot of its moisture, and it's very cold. So it's now sinking down into the valley of the sun, let's say, and it is heating up. So two things are working against us here. One is it's lost most of its water, so it doesn't have much to give us. Number two is it's now becoming warmer air. And so that warmer air as it sinks has the capacity to store a lot. So any moisture that's around, it's sucking up into water vapor. And so it tends to dry out the area for us on the east side of the mountain range. And so we see these um, rain shadow deserts occur in other places, certainly in uh, the Andes and any place where the air mass has to rise up over a high elevation, it's going to lose some moisture on the one side and be dry on the other. A little interesting fact for us, of course, is that we do get monsoon season. And really, 
One of the reasons we get that is there's a slight change in the jet stream where it kind of comes south here a little. And a lot of times it'll miss the Sierras and kind of come up the Gulf of California. So it's got two things going for it. One, it doesn't have to go up and over the mountain and lose lots of moisture. And two, it's got some extra moisture right here in the Gulf and it comes up from the south. And so now it has some moisture, comes into the valley. A lot of times it'll rise up to the plateau. The rising up causes the air mass to cool and then the rain starts to fall. And so we get monsoon season because there's kind of a change in the jet stream in general. And that's one of the reasons we get rain then, and we don't get rain typically because of the Sierra Nevadas blocking our way. Okay, so that's number uh, three. So the fourth one we'll talk about, I'm just going to jump through that. You can look at that. Uh, coastal. So not everywhere, but on places, um, coastal environments here, you can see that there is uh, some cold air masses. So there's cold ocean currents. So the cold ocean currents are making the air above it colder. So in places like here and over here in Africa, we see very dry conditions because once again, the air mass is very cold. So not every coast, of course, but places where you have cold ocean currents that are moving up or down the coast, those are driving the temperature of the air. The air very cold, can't hold much moisture, so there's not much to give back, and we get dry conditions there. We also see in the final place the polar deserts, and so these are the big ones, really. Uh, Greenland and Antarctica are very large, and they're considered a desert because they get less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. Very cold, so it's that going back to the temperature of the air mass again. So it just doesn't have much ability to hold or store water so moving across the whole continent rising and falling doesn't matter because there's not much moisture in the air mass to give back okay what else and so look we, we want to be able to identify some of these uh deserts because if we see something in the rock record that indicates a desert we'd like to be able to puzzle out what type it was and maybe what was causing it was it the position of the continent was it near the poles it was a polar desert was it near tw uh, 30 degrees north or south of the equator and that's why it was a desert was there some rain shadow effect going on it'd be interesting if we could puzzle that out and that's one of the things we could do but that being said one of the best preserved types of deserts in the rock record would be the very big sand dunes that you imagined in the beginning of this story probably an example of that is exposed in the Grand Canyon, and it's called the Coconino Sandstone, and it's this thick layer right here. It's all sandstone, and it is the remnants of big sand dunes, much like the Sahara Desert. So although the other deserts can be recorded, there just isn't as much material. So the big sand dunes, of course, that's a lot of material that can be buried and those pieces can be turned into sedimentary rocks, the sand grains. In other places where there isn't a lot of sand, so there's not a lot of material, it's harder to preserve those types of environments. But we can still get some thinner or smaller depositional features that we might be able to identify. If we were to look at... Um, oh, and there's also extraterrestrial deserts, so we could look at other planets like Mars. Obviously, less than 10 inches of rainfall there, so... Uh, we could use some things that we see here to kind of figure out what's happening on other planets. Um, what else? Uh, there's a few processes I'm going to blaze through. Uh, I always end up talking too long, so I'm going to try and jump through a few things here. But um, a couple things that we can see. These things here, these features on the left, are called vent effects. And now these have been moved to this location for a picture. But what we can see is there are these unusual shaped large gravels that have this kind of ridge on the back here. They actually almost look like a pyramid shape. And the idea is that these larger pieces that are strewn about in the desert floor when there's not a lot of sand get abraded by the material that's being blown across here and carved into these little pyramid shaped things with these ridges. Imagine if the wind, I'm gonna use this one here, was blowing 
this direction, right, from almost the bottom here to the top. And it's carving both sides, and there's a little ridge in the middle here. And so they're indicative of wind erosion. And so sometimes we can find these, they're not always this big, you can even find small ones that are embedded in a deposit. And if we can pry them out and look at them, we can look at for this distinct feature that could tell us that this was a wind abraded feature, and that might give us an indication of the type of depositional environment. The other kind of weirdness, though not always preserved in the rock record, but you can see today, is this idea of these balanced rocks kind of story. And sometimes it's an indication of different rock strength, but a lot of times it's basically telling us that this is wind, is picking up the sand that's around here. And the idea is the general strength of the wind can't lift the sand much higher than this. And so over long periods of time, the sand really isn't getting up this high. And just the bottom portion is being abraded. And so we get this little pedestal looking thing because of the elevation of the sand based on the wind speed. So we can use some of those features to determine it's a, a desert. We do also get some unique features in um, deserts, something called a desert pavement. We have it here in Arizona, and this can be preserved in the rock record. What we see here is this very thin gravel kind of covering. And a lot of times if you're out in the desert, people have hiked around and seen this. It almost looks like old pavement. And you think, who paved a road out in the middle of nowhere? But really what it is, it is actually called desert pavement. And it is in areas where we've blown away all the fine material and left behind the large material that could not be moved by the wind. And this closely packed larger material actually acts as a barrier to the fine stuff that's below it. And so a lot of times if you're out here, they won't let you ride your mechanical devices, your bikes and quads and whatever because if you tear this up you expose the fine dust and then of course the wind comes along it gets in the atmosphere and it causes problems and so this is actually good for us if we can leave it undisturbed because it reduces some of the dust in the atmosphere and so what that would kind of look like is is this little image here the debris gets washed off the mountains and falls down into the basins here like let's say in Arizona and it's a collection of everything big and small but the wind is picking up the very small, tiny pieces and is picking it up into the air and blowing it away somewhere else. But it's leaving behind the larger pieces. So actually we get what's called deflation, which means the surface is lowered a little because we're removing material until we reach a point where the larger pieces are closely packed enough that they're actually preserving what's beneath it. And this last panel is kind of what you saw in the previous image called desert pavement and it's going to preserving this material here below it so this layer here could be preserved in the rock record so we'd have this collection of very poorly sorted material and then all this little thin layer and then another you know poorly sorted material on top and this thin layer here preserved in the rock record could tell us something about how dry it was and you know that it, we had this kind of desert pavement being created um, so we know that you know the the winds picking up the small pieces so this is how we get this deflation happening and of course some of this material that's really small can travel hundreds if not thousands of miles and be deposited somewhere else we know, of course, that they can move lots of stuff. The wind can. We've seen the haboobs come through here. They're kind of terrifying. Um, so, but it's taking material from one place and depositing it somewhere else. The other thing here is, okay, so look, we certainly want to bring this back to the rocks because that's what we do in geology is we look at the rock record to see what's happening. And one of the key things that we see in Aeolian processes means wind derived, right? And so what we see, and we've talked about this, we talked about sedimentary rocks. There is a specific structure that's left behind from big desert sand dunes. Those are called cross beds. And it's based on the idea of how sand dunes move. Remember, if you will, from sedimentary rocks, we had this 
big sand dune where sand was pushed up a gentle side and avalanche down a steep side. And so what we preserve is the, what's called the avalanche face. It's this face here is the bottom portion of a large sand dune. And so what we can determine from that is the direction the wind was blowing. So the two things that tell me this is wind derived and not water derived is that the cross bed layer, which is this angled layer here that's bordered by a more flat layer top and bottom, is larger than one meter. And so when we have these cross beds that are larger than one meter, they're usually associated with desert sand dunes. Second, remember, this is the avalanche face. The sand was avalanching down and then it gets flat here. So if you're confused about this, you can always go back to the sedimentary structure lab and, or lecture and kind of look at that. But this would tell us that the wind was blowing from here on the right side to the left side. Okay, so it's blowing down like this. And of course, if we map all these out in the rocks, we can figure out the ancient wind direction. Look, here, here's a, a current dune. It hasn't been turned into a rock yet, and it's been preserved kind of the bottom portion. And you could see this is from the dune itself, and those are the cross beds. They're just not turned into a rock yet. And so remember, you know, the present is the key to the past story. We see this today in dunes, and it tells us wind direction, and we use it for those. Okay? And so here's the, the quick story that is a review of the said stuff, right? So here we have a sand dune. Wind comes up, it brings the material up here, and then it avalanches down. And every time it avalanches, it deposits an angular layer here that's the internal structure of a dune. Now, we only preserve the bottom portion, maybe the bottom quarter, when a large event comes through and blasts this apart and buries it, but only preserves the bottom. But remember, this angle here is this face is what's preserved and is showing me the direction. Okay, so we can use the cross beds to tell us ancient wind direction. Okay, more you say? Oh golly. So sometimes it's useful to identify some sand dunes here. And so we could talk a little bit about types and they kind of give us different environments of deposition. And so we can have what are called so these are the four that i'm going to be mean and have you kind of you know figure out we won't do these bottom two here the star and the barkanoid thing here but these top four here we get the these barkan dunes that look like these little weird shaped things with legs this tells me still i can still in general and a lot of these see a gentle side and a steep side that means the wind must be going this way we tend to get barkan dunes like this where we have not much sand. So there's just these dunes. The rest of the material here is just rock. So it's not like a Sahara Desert type environment. It's where there's a limited sand supply. But I get these kind of unique shapes because in the middle here there's just more sand to move. It moves a little slower. On the edges there's less sand. They move a little faster. And we get these unique barkans. Parabolics or just the opposite, except the steep side is on that side there, and the trailing legs are here, because the difference between a barkan and a parabolic is vegetation. Vegetation slows down the thin layers of sand here on the edges, and so they trail, and the bigger mass can kind of plow over them. We typically get, when there's lots of sand, something like this, a transverse, where the sand dunes are just perpendicular to the wind direction. And then we can also get what are called longitudinal, when we have multiple wind directions, which typically is associated with some seasonal type of wind direction. And so longitudinal would look something like this, where they're kind of sort of parallel to the wind direction, but those are the kind of types that are more common like these here. Um, I can't remember. Desert varnish, I think I just threw in there. So you heard the term uh, is certainly something you might see petroglyphs kind of carved into. It is a coating that's on top of a lot of sands, sandstones, and desert deposits. Uh, 
there's still some argument about whether it's biological or not. So whether something is growing on here and it is causing the rock to be stained like this. And then, of course, people come along and carve away that to leave the petroglyphs like this, or if it's something non-biologic. But desert varnish does exist for sure. And like I said, you see petroglyphs that are carved into this coating that's on usually some sandstones. Okay, so for us, these are the things we would look for if we were to look at the rock record and try to identify a desert. And like I said, the other deserts are very hard to recognize because they don't have a lot of material left behind. The ones that are fairly easy to ID are something that you see on the right in that image. Big cross beds, greater than a meter, almost always mean desert sand dunes. And look, this is not something that just was flat and tilted because they're going all different directions. It would be impossible to tilt it and get all these different directions. It just means that the direction of wind might have changed or you're not looking at it perpendicular to the direction the wind was going. So we want to look for large scale cross beds, very well rounded and sorted. The wind is a great sorter. It can't pick up the gravels and the really tiny silts get taken far away. You leave behind only the sands. So they're all about the same size. Frosted grains means that they have that white coating because the sand grains are quartz typically. They're impacting each other and they make the sand grains opaque. We can see some tracks in there. Sometimes there's some vent effects that are preserved in there. And this just means that a lot of times there's either a water deposit above or below indicating a change from the dry conditions. Okay, and then finally, just so we talk a little bit about what we see here in the desert southwest here, one of the things we see certainly is some desert conditions based on our less than 10 inches of rainfall. Up here in the Colorado Plateau, they're not as low. The elevation allows it to get some more moisture. We're here low. One of the reasons that this is high and we are low is because we are in what's called the Basin and Range Province. And what's happening to our crust here is it is being extended. We are pulling apart the crust here. And so we are getting normal faults, whether they look like this in places or like this, they're still normal faults. Well, that means the crust is being extended, pulled apart. And so it is thinning and lowering the crust, even though we do have mountain ranges here. That's not happening here on the Colorado Plateau, but only down here in this area labeled as the Basin and Range. And so today we're extending. That wasn't the case in the geologic past. We were compressing, but now we're extending. We're pulling apart, and that's still going on today. And so when we get these normal faults, this is why the valley and the areas around here look the way they do. We have a little uplift and a down dropping of blocks. So we live here in the valley, but over geologic time, we're weathering these cliffs, which are then taking the debris and washing them down into the valley. But there's usually no big river system here. And so it washes into the valley and sinks into the ground. Good for us because we get some groundwater. But these Fans here slowly coalesce and in course places here in the valley they have connected. We are living on the sediment that is eroded off of the cliffs here into the valley and filled the valley. So today for us we have a very deep deep valley with a lot of fill and just a little bit of the mountain ranges that are kind of sticking up. And so this is what we see today and of course the idea of the stretching of the crust is also thinning, which means it's lowering the crust, so we're low down. We have the Sierra Nevadas as a big mountain range, and that gives us our rain shadow effect, which has given us the desert conditions that we experience here in the valley. And there's some beautiful pictures. <laughs> so this is what you see, right? This is, this is all that's left. This is a basin and range. This is the basin. There's the range. This is the basin. There's the range. But... There's been so much erosion, so much fill, the ranges don't seem very big anymore. And the valleys are just full, chock full of debris. And so here's a big alluvial fan. 
Here's some alluvial fans here, and here's the bottom of the basin here, this Death Valley. And so we see these features crop up here in the southwest and in the basin and range province that we live in. And of course, the very dry conditions kind of give us, oh, look, no vegetation. All right. I think we did it. Holy cow, we did. All right. So hopefully that's helpful. And uh, we'll see you next time.